morning, church, and welcome to Church Online. Your daily verse for this morning is Isaiah 25, verse 1. It says, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name, for in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. We are so excited that you have joined us, so let's get church started.
Well, hey, good morning once again. It's so good to see everybody and so many new faces and familiar faces and friendly faces and faces that aren't too sure and all those things all at one time. And uh, it's good to be together in church. Once again, my name is Brett, and um, we started this journey 10 years ago this next January. And uh, it's amazing what God has done. Started six people. So um, almost this row. <laughs> And uh, there's more people probably in this row than started at church, and uh, it's exciting to get to be together. Today, I want to answer a few questions. Maybe we can close those doors. Uh, that will help. Uh, we can answer a few questions today. I've just got a, a simple a question to ask us. What are we even doing here? Why do we come to church? Why do we gather in this way? What are we even doing here? Why are we here on a Sunday morning? Now, I have to say it was a, a great surprise. We went through the Starbucks drive through this morning, and, and the lady asked us, what church do you go to? And I said, oh, Saints Church, because she asked what we, were, what we were doing today. We said, we're going to church. And she goes, that's great. Uh, like four other couples have already been through here. And so, I mean, she's like, same church, so maybe, you know, like there's something going on there. I said, yes, there's absolutely something going on there. And uh, so, anyways keep going to Starbucks. Is that, I, I don't know what the, we're going to have coffee back here soon, which I know everyone is excited about as things shift and change and restrictions shift and change. And I just want to, before we jump into the word, I just want to remind us uh, that we are here to create a place that is loving and safe for all people. And it doesn't matter what your personal choice is. There's a place here for you. If somebody wants to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. That's okay. That's the season that we're in right now. That's where the steps that we're taking. But this isn't your place. This is not a place for anyone to be rejected or to be turned away or to be looked down upon or be felt that in any way, shape, or form. This is a place where anyone and everyone can come to discover the hope in life that's found in Jesus. And there's no, there's no asterisk beside anyone and everyone. Sorry for cutting off your chair. There's no asterisk <laughs> for anyone and everyone. Jesus was very explicit. He was very clear. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He's not too concerned about your background. You're worried about it. He's not worried about it. So this is a place for anyone and everyone to discover that hope in life that's found in Jesus. So what are we even doing here, Jordan McCourt? What are we doing here? Here's what we're doing here. First thing, first thought, if you're taking notes, that would be great. If you're not, that's not as great. First thing, <laughs> we are here to worship Jesus. That's what we're here for. That's, that's what we do. And that doesn't only mean in song. Sometimes we're like, okay, but no, that's the music part. No, no, no. We worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, which means with every part of my being, I worship him. I worship him when I go uh, to work, and I work unto the Lord, not unto my boss. And there's not many amens to that one. When I go home and I'm with my family and with, them, with my kids, it's an act of worship. When I, when I show them what it means to follow Jesus with my whole heart, that's an act of worship. When, when I love my neighbor and, and, and we just have a great time connecting, that's amazing. When I'm forgiving my neighbor because they did something crazy, it's an act of worship. Come on, we are here to worship Jesus first, but please don't take my word for it. Isaiah 66, 1, you don't have it at the back, don't worry about it. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house he will build for me? Come on, this is the house we will build for him. But the, in reality, it's the house he's building for himself because we don't build the church. Jesus builds the church. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We don't have to worry about building the church. It's our job to build up the body of Christ, to build one another up, to equip the saints, to do the work of the ministry. It's our job to build up, stir up, cheer up, to encourage, to inspire, to pray, to prophesy, to love one another, to form community, to be found in community, to be known and to be loved. That's what we're doing here. And we're doing it all in the wonderful, beautiful, powerful, mighty name of Jesus. Do we have any people that amen in this church today? Come on, somebody. I know it's been a while. I tried to get here multiple times, but COVID took me out. I got bit by Rona, and she took me out. I was on my, this is like when the Apostle Paul writes a letter, 
And he's like, I got, I got struck at sea and I could not make it. My heart is with you and I can't wait till we're together again. I'm like, dear Glory Hills, I've been bit by the Rona and my heart is with you. My body is not and I cannot wait until we are together again. Psalm 66, 4 says, everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises, shouting your name in glorious songs. Philippians 2, verse 9 to 11. If I'm going too fast, we'll get you the notes later. Therefore, God elevated him, who is Jesus, to the highest place of honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And this is an important distinction. If you're taking notes, make the distinction of the three places. There's three places that will worship Jesus and they will declare that he is king of all kings and lord of all lords in heaven. That's the first place. They're already doing it. They're gathered round the throne and the angels and all that are there, the cloud of witnesses are lifting up the name of Jesus saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then as we pray, what do we pray? We pray for heaven and on earth. So it says that everyone on earth will worship Jesus. But it also says something significant, and we can't miss it, and we shouldn't leave it out, though sometimes we do, and we don't like to talk about it. It says, and under the earth, meaning, what does that mean? That every evil force, every principality and power is subject to the authority of Jesus Christ. It means that you've already won, that Jesus has already won. There's this saying in Latin, Christ is victus. Christ is victorious. He's already won. So when we lift up the name of Jesus, Psalm 22, you know this already. You might not if you don't write it down. But Psalm 22 says that God is enthroned in the praises of his people. So when we sing and when we worship and we praise or when we honor him by not giving that guy the finger when he drives by you and cuts you off. That's honoring the Lord when you just make that choice. You're like, listen, if you know me, that's the choice. Not me. I'm honoring the Lord with my choice, Jordan. (laughs) And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. I love that in that passage I read right at the beginning of worship in Colossians 1 verse 18. It says, so Jesus is first in everything. Jesus is first in everything. Everything, And I guess the first question that we have to ask ourselves after that other one of what are we doing here is, is he first in everything? To worship Jesus means simply that we put Jesus first in every area of life. When we gather in this way and we sing, we're actually ministering to the Lord. We minister to the Lord. And you're like, well, how could I do anything for him? This is the offering that I have to bring. Have you ever done the love languages test? Any, anyone with your spouse done the love languages test? Any people uh, think it's entirely accurate? Yeah. Anyone not convinced? You didn't answer honestly. <laughs> <laughs> but in the love languages test, you learn that there's ways that your spouse loves to be loved. And sometimes we try and superimpose the way that we love onto the way that uh, they want to be loved. And the same thing is true in church. We worship him and we worship him in song, even if you don't feel like it, even if you're not emotional, even if you don't feel like you're a music person, we worship him in this way because it's the way that he wants to be loved. It's the way that he said, listen, this is how you approach me. Why? Because music does something that connects us. And if you're not a music person, then don't get pumped up the next time you go to a concert or to a hockey game. Or don't get afraid when music changes on your favorite Netflix show and you have to switch it to a cartoon. We're here to worship him. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 12. As we worship him, this is what it says. As we worship him, things are going to happen. Since the new way gives us such confidence, meaning that when you follow Jesus, you can step into a new season of God confidence. And I, and I just want to encourage you today, if, if you struggle in this area, you say, like, I don't know who I am. I'm trying to find my identity. I lack confidence. When you place your identity in Jesus, you are finding a, a new sense of God confidence. It's not an earthly confidence in my ability. I just have a confidence in Jesus that if I trust him, he's going to lead me. He's going to guide me. He's going to transform me. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. I underlined that. In my Bible, we can be very 
bold. And not just talking about being bold in the areas of life, like, I need to talk to your manager kind of bold. I'm talking about the boldness that comes that says, hey, I just believe that Jesus is king over everything and there's a need in your situation. So I'm going to either address it naturally. I'm going to just, you need some food. I'm going to give you some food. You need some money. I'm going to give you some cash. Or, hey, I see that you're sick. Could I just like maybe pray for you and your family? Because it seems like you're going through a hard time. We get this confidence. Why? Not because we've done everything, but because Jesus has done it all. And he's worthy of it all, and he's victorious over it all. So we are not like, this is verse 3, we are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. Let me just comment on this, because we're having a party in here today. (laughs) In the Old Testament, Moses would go, and he would go into the presence of God, And when he went to the presence, he would go up to Sinai or he'd go into a tent of meeting. And when he came out of of that tent and he had been with God, and and the Bible says that that Moses was considered a friend of God. He talked to God as if he was a friend and in that way, that Moses' physical body would be glowing. And people were rattled. Like if you came to church and then you left physically glowing, people would be concerned about you. And people were in that same way. So it says Moses would wear a veil because people were just so nervous. He says, we don't have to be like that. The spirit of God is in us. Jesus is in us. And he's radiating his hope, his love, and his life. And in this new covenant, since Jesus came and died on the cross and is resurrected, your life can now glow with that same hope in life. And you don't have to put a veil on. You don't have to cover it up. Verse 16, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Come on, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord who is spirit spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. So the more we worship, the more we surrender, the more we lay our lives down, the more we trust him with every part, the more we let him in, the more we look more and more like him. And that doesn't mean you're going to grow a beard and long hair and wear a blue sash. It means your, your character is going to change. He's going to round off the rough edges. He's gonna, your heart's going to start to break and beat for the same things that break and make his heart beat. So that leads us To our second thought, what are we even doing here? First is to worship Jesus. As we worship him, we look more like Jesus. Second, what's the second thing that we're here to do? It's going to be hard. It's going to be complicated. You've never heard this before. It's a new revelation. Make disciples. We know it. We just don't like it. Because we constantly live in a state of I'm not enough. I don't know enough. I can't say it well enough. I can't process it enough. I don't know that person well enough. Or maybe they'll know me too well, and they're going to see all this craziness that I'm still dealing with. Can I tell you that when you share Jesus with somebody and you expose your kind of crazy, they feel relieved because it's their kind of crazy. And they know that if Jesus didn't wipe you off or or write you off, that there's still hope for him. So we don't have to be afraid. The greatest deception of the enemy, who is already lost, by the way, is to whisper and to deceive you that you're not enough, that you don't have enough, that you don't know enough. All you have to know is Jesus is king of all kings and lord of all lords, and we surrender our whole life to him. Every idea is submitted to him. If Jesus isn't lord of all, he's not lord at all. He's got to be Lord of all. So we make disciples. These are the, this is Jesus calling his disciples. And by the way, it still applies to us today. Shout out to Pastor Sim Dendy for breaking it down. Jesus called out to them. This is Mark 1, 17 to 18. Come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Before I kind of break this down. I want us to notice um, in scripture, there's a principle when we're reading it called the rule of first mention. So when Jesus, you know, when anyone speaks and states something new, we pay attention to it. Um, Also, we know this from just from life that when somebody has the last or the final word, you pay attention to it. 
So notice this. The first thing that Jesus says to this whole group of people as he begins his earthly ministry is, come and follow me and I will teach you how to be fishers of men. The last thing that he says as he's departing on this earth is, therefore I have been given all authority in heaven, therefore go and make disciples. Those two thoughts are connected together. He says, I'm going to make you fishers of men and then go and make disciples. It's like he's putting an exclamation point to the disciples going, hey, do you remember that time I first called you? Do you remember that time that, that you were so excited about following me that you just told everyone everything all the time did anyone have that stage in their christian life in their christian journey it's like i just told everyone everything all the time and then maturity set in which is actually spiritual immaturity because maturity says that we make disciples that we go boldly that we allow jesus to lead us and guide us and speak through us So maturity is not defined by I can be composed and properly articulate my faith completely accurately to the nth degree. Maturity looks like I boldly follow Jesus. I trust him. I'm following him one step at a time, and I will boldly proclaim his goodness and his faithfulness. You know when you get that new iPhone, and you're just so excited and you're so proud? There's only one other experience that, that mirrors an iPhone, new iPhone person, is a young lady getting engaged. Because she just worships at a new level. That hand has never gone so high as if to go, listen, I need you to know I've got this now. She just needs you to know. And like she holds her drink in a whole new way. You're like, wow, this just changed everything about you. No, I just can't help but tell. I'm so excited. It's like when you get a new iPhone, you're like, listen, this thing, the way that it organized my mail and the way that it syncs up with all of my devices, what? It has changed my life. How flippantly we declare that something has changed our lives when someone already has and is. So we make disciples. Let's just go thought by thought through Mark 1, verse 17 to 18. I, I just came fully loaded today, so I'm just going to let everyone have it. Okay, in the best possible way, the word. Come. That's the first thing Jesus said. He said, come follow me, but the first word is come. What is he saying? He's saying, you are welcome. Everyone is invited. When we think about church and what are we doing here, Jesus says, Come. I want my house to be full. I want my house to be full, not just to have peoples and seats and and chairs and and rows and buildings and places, but I want people to encounter me. It starts with an invitation. Come. Come on. It starts with you responding to the invitation to come. It starts with you responding to the call of God saying, I think maybe I should go to church this Sunday. It starts with somebody responding to your invitation when you say, hey, you you should just come with me. It's not as weird as you think. It's weirder. Because when we say come, we're saying come to a place of encounter. Come to a place of encounter where everyone can experience God. Come. The next thing he says is, follow me. Now, for the OGs in the room, you know this one. Why? Because we follow Jesus. Pretty good. He says, follow me. Because Jesus is inviting us on a journey. He says, I have something to share with you. I got something to show you. I got something that you can discover not only about the world, but about yourself. He says, come, I want you to walk with me. When he says, follow me, he's like, we're going to go somewhere. You might feel like you don't have direction, that you don't know where you're headed or where you're going, but Jesus says, come, follow me. I'm going to take you on a journey. He says, follow me. He says, come on, let's gather and let's do this together. Let's come and work. It's why he called what? He called 12 disciples that rippled out into hundreds that would follow Jesus as he walked from place to place, season to season, moment to moment. It's a call for us to gather. He says, I will show you how. That's the next part of the phrase. I will show you how. Meaning Jesus 
will show you how to live. He'll show you how to love. He'll show you how to be loved. He says, we're not just going to talk about it. I'm going to show you what hope is, what love is. I will show you how. Sometimes we read scriptures, at least I do. And I long for the things that I see on the page to be active in my life. Have you ever read a miracle of Jesus and gone, man, can you imagine if Jesus says, I will show you how. I will show you how. Last part of that phrase, it says, fish for people. It's not just about you. It's not just about me. We have a bigger mission. Jesus is calling each of us to reach the people in our worlds. Sometimes it's easier for us to accept the call to reach the world because it generally culminates in a two-week missions trip where we go away for two weeks and you have all these amazing encounters And you just talk to people randomly in the streets with this new boldness that you've never had before in your life. And you pray for people with a new boldness that you've never had in your life. And you just go on this trip and you build things and you're sweaty and you take pictures and you have uh, memorabilia from your trip, souvenirs for everybody. Bad chocolate from that person on the street that you just couldn't say no to. The whole mission trip culminates in that. And we come back home like, why can't we see that here? The reason why you stepped out in boldness, it wasn't because it was boldness. It's because you're not accountable to the person on the street. You get to leave the country. Sometimes we've traded this idea of being spiritual for being random. So we show up in the freezer aisle at Save on Foods when it all lights up and glows. When you walk by, which is the best. And you stand there looking at the Magnum bars. Praying that the calories don't count. (laughs) And then you say, Jesus, if you really want me to reach somebody today, I'm going to stand with the Magnum bars. And if someone comes and reaches for that chocolate almond box, then I will know that it's my opportunity to stand up and speak out and to say something. But only if they touch the chocolate almond box. If they do not touch the chocolate and almond box, then it is not from you. And even though they're weeping on their cart, clearly that's not the person I should be talking to because it's only spiritual if it's completely random. No, we feel that way because we're completely unaccountable. Because we don't have to walk with that person through their pain. We don't have to walk with them through what they're processing. If it's random, I can drop a love bomb on you and walk away. That's not what Jesus called us to. He says you're going to make disciples. Make disciples, which means it's going to be hands-on, which means you've got to roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty. We've got to be in one another's lives, and, and we can do that now in a way that we've maybe been longing to do, where we can have people in our homes and in our backyards. You know, God, stop the snow in Jesus' name. We need some sun. There is a, a pastor named John Wesley who the Internet sometimes tells us said this quote. There's some dispute. He used to say, set me on fire and watch me burn. Not physically. He's talking spiritually. On May 24th, 1738, he experienced what has come to be called his moment of conversion when he felt his heart was strangely warmed. Kind of sounds like the Grinch. But when Jesus comes in to our lives, he begins to strangely warm the places of us that we didn't know were there. He gives us an increased capacity to love, to see past the mistakes. He sees an increased, he gives us an increased capacity to keep no record of wrong. 
He gives us this increased capacity to be long-suffering and to, to deal with people walking all over you. Just to remind you, if you prayed, Lord, let me be a bridge to my community, you're going to get walked all over. Yesterday, uh, I've discovered in COVID season, I, I love fire and fire tables, particularly in the summer. If you follow me on social media, you'll just see it all the time. And I had to ramp it back because some people in the church got jealous. But <laughs> just Matt and Christy, it's fine. <sighs> it's not true. But one of my favorite things is my parents have an acreage and they have this outdoor enclosed fireplace and just watching that fire burn. And I feel like sometimes I get the most clarity just sitting there. When you're just processing, and I was watching the fire yesterday, and it, I'm like, man, this is good for my soul. And as I was watching it, we, we had a whole bunch of damp wood, like deadfall that we cut down and that we were putting in the fire. And you know when you put that deadfall in the fire, uh, I would put it on the side to warm it up before moving it into the hot coals. You just hear that hiss, right? It's like, as it begins to just release all its moisture gets dried out. You know, a number of months ago, we did the uh, team night here, and we had a dunk tank, the world-famous dunk tank. And uh, many of us chose to wear less clothes, but Pastor Jeremy decided to wear all the clothes to try and stay warm. But how many know that you get more cold when you wear more clothes and so he was freezing and chattering, and his teeth were knocking together. He had to get dental work after. It was mind-boggling. He was just freezing, and he was damp, and he was sticky, and he was moving around weird because that's what happens when you fall into the water. You just get so damp, and you get bogged down, and you get, you get wet. When we come into the presence of Jesus, he begins to warm our hearts. He begins to warm us up. And sometimes as he begins to warm us up, there is a hiss that begins to let out. That hiss of the wet wood and that hiss are the aches and the pains and the tears that you've cried. As he begins to warm you up and bring you back to life and stir hope and life inside of your bones. He's taken all those things that are bogging you down. That you say, my soul is damp and cold and tired and weary. He's taken all those things and he's warming you up. And there's a hiss that comes and it's a cry and it's a scream and it's tears and it's okay. Because you were thought you were lost but my friend, can I tell you that with Jesus, you are found. With Jesus, you are found. That wet that's gotten all over you in this, this last season is fear, insecurity, doubt, loneliness, a hope deferred. Robert says a heart, hope deferred makes the heart sick. That wet that's got all over you, that's dampened the fire that once burned bright, was you putting your ideology before your own identity and before Jesus. That dampness. Can I tell you? Jesus wants to burn it all up. He wants to burn it all up. And if you trust him, and if you let him, when you find Jesus, you will find the real you. When you come to church, you're warming up. You're defrosting. You're de-icing. That's what this next season is. You're defrosting. And for those whose fire burns bright, you're warming others in this room. Your faith is carrying through somebody else who's in the midst of pain, who's in the midst of brokenness, who's in the midst of warming up. Your faith is carrying them. So what do we do about this? Why do we even come here? What do we do is we just keep showing up. 
We just keep showing up and we worship Jesus and we lift up the name of Jesus and he becomes king in your heart and in my heart and in the midst of us and faith will begin to rise and hope will be found when you just keep showing up. You're like, well, I kind of got this schedule thing. Clear it. You took two years off. I love F1 racing. Anyone F1 racing fans in the house? Thank you for those hands. Oh, Randall, good to see you. A couple seasons ago, Roman Grosjean, the end of a race, had a catastrophic accident which sent his car flying and erupting into flames. And he said that in those moments, cover your kids' ears, he thought he was going to die. He watched his life flash before his eyes, his kids flashed before his eyes and he realized this is the end of me. They cannot get to me. And in an act of courage, he says, I'm not going out this way. And he climbed out of his car, burning his legs and his hands to the point where they're almost unrecognizable. How many know that when you get burned, you are marked? But when you get burned with the love and the power and presence of Jesus, you're marked with hope. You're marked with a destiny. You're marked with eternity. You're marked. This is 1 Timothy 1 verse 9. For God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. This is the last thing I want to give you, but don't miss it. It says, for God has saved us. When you accept Jesus into your life, he saved you from eternity separated from him. He honors your free will choice. If you choose him, you spend eternity with him. If you don't, you choose not to spend eternity with him. He honors your choice. But how many know that he hasn't just saved us from something, he saved you for something? And it goes on to say in 2 Timothy 1 verse 9 that he saved us and then he called us. He called us. There is a calling on your life. Calling is not reserved for people with a microphone uh, that stand on a stage on a Sunday morning. Calling is not reserved for people with great beards and big guitars. Calling is not reserved for people that you deem to be spiritual. Calling is reserved for those who call on the name of the Lord. He says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we don't live saved from something. We live saved for something. God saved me for a purpose. Come on. And he calls me. There's a calling on your life. There's a destiny on your life. There's a direction on your life. And you're like, well, but my career is just a career and it's normal. There's something beautiful about the normalcy of what you do because we have traded the supernatural for the spectacular. It doesn't always have to be big and fancy for it to be from the Lord. The way that you love, the way that you care, the way that you take care of your neighbor, the way you check in on your co-worker at work, the way that you bring them that coffee just because you felt like you were supposed to and you learned that that was the day that their dad died. There's something significant about you. There's something significant about you and the significance on you is that Jesus has called you. And he says as we continue this verse, he saved you, he called you, Not according to our works or what we could do or what we have done, but according to his own purpose. There's a purpose for you. There's a purpose on your life. Come on, you're saved. You're called. There's a purpose on your life. And you are uniquely grace. It says to you there's a purpose, and he does it through his grace. Which means he gives you the supernatural ability to accomplish all the things that he has for you. And just like any other skill, talent, or ability, you gotta practice, you gotta get better at it. You can grow in it. You can grow in your spiritual gifts. You can grow in loving one another. And it takes some time. It's like me and golf. It's just gonna take some time, a lifetime for me to be okay. And maybe some expensive clubs and slice correcting balls. But then I will be okay. If 
I could leave you with anything today, I want you to walk out that door knowing that it's not a mistake that you're here. You're not a mistake on this planet. You're not a mistake in this place. I want you to walk out that door knowing that God has called you for such a time as this to your neighborhood, to your job, to your community, to your region, to your street, to your block, to your house. That he's called you into this career and he's going to tell you when it's time to change. I just get this sense that there's a number of people in the room that says, I'm just, I think I need to change. Don't change because you want to change. Change because Jesus is leading you to it. You could be using this change to fill a need inside of your soul that is actually a Jesus-sized hole. And you're hoping that your career and paycheck would just compensate for what you're feeling. What you're feeling is a lack of hope, not because you don't earn enough. Not because the job's not right or the crew or the squad's not right. But because you've left this gap. Jesus wants to remind you today that you're saved and you're called. You have purpose. And he's going to help you accomplish it with his grace. Come on, can we stand together today? You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore.
It's burning, but it's not the fire that it once was. And Jesus wants to come and he wants to blow, put oxygen onto those coals. And as you bring those areas that you've been holding on to so tightly that define you of your identity and you even bring those things that you're afraid of that, that scare you, some of those tendencies that you wish that you didn't have and you lay those at the feet of Jesus, he will blow and they'll catch flame. Those very things that you think are holding you back are gonna propel you forward as the Holy Spirit comes and fans that fire into flame. So if you're here today and you say, that's me, I need that stirring when the Holy Spirit was poured out on earth in the upper room, it says that there was a mighty rushing wind. It was the breath of God that blew. And right now, if you're here in this place, this is what I want us to do. If you're here in this place, you say, God, fan me into flame. Fan my coals into flame. I just want you to just raise your hands if you feel comfortable, and I want you to raise them if you don't. And you say, God, I just surrender to you right now. Fan this fire into flame. Stir this thing up inside of me. Would you come and blow right now by the breath of your Holy Spirit? And it doesn't have to be crazy, and it doesn't have to be out of control. God, would you just come blow and put oxygen onto those coals and fan them up? God, we surrender. We lay our, our, our dreams and our ambitions, our personalities, we lay it at your feet. Come on, he wants to come and blow right across your heart, right across your spirit. He wants to stir you up. Second thing is this, just keep pouring out, keep calling out to him if that's you. But second thing is if you're here today and you've not ever invited Jesus Christ into your heart, whether you're in the room or you're online, I want to 
invite you to take that step today. It's the beginning of a journey. It's not the end. It's the very beginning. But you don't have to walk through life alone anymore. You can hold on to the hand of the one who holds the world. You can hold on to the hand of the one who holds the world. And you go, oh, but I got so many questions. My friends, can I tell you? He's got so many answers. He's got so many answers. So if you're here today, if you're online, you would say, I want to invite Jesus into my life. I'm going to count down to three. When I get to one, you give me a lightning fast ninja wave. And you say, yeah, that's me. I want to invite Jesus into my life. I want to start that journey with Jesus. If that's you, give me a wave in three, two, one. You want to invite Jesus into your life today for the first time. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? When I'm scanning the room, you say, yeah, I want to invite Jesus Christ into my life. I want to make him the Lord and Savior of my life. Come on, I'm so thankful church, I hope next week we could double, triple, quadruple. See 10, 15, 20, 30 hands responding as you respond to the boldness that God's placed in you. Come on, let's pray this prayer together uh, and walk with those who are inviting Jesus into their lives for the first time today. Come on, we pray this prayer. Just repeat after me. Say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I, need you I need you now more than ever. Now more than ever. So I give you everything. So I give you everything. My wins and my losses. My wins and my losses. My sins and my successes. My sins and my successes. They're all yours. They're all yours. From this moment forward. From this moment forward. I'm following you. I'm following you. One step at a time. One step at a time. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, can we give a big round of applause for those who invited Jesus into their lives for the very first time? What I love is that Pastor Brett brings the word each and every week. And it's so great that, hey, if we can't do church together, we can still do church online. If you want to get connected, remember to text hello to the number at the bottom of the screen. And we are going to do this all again coming up next week.